Hello and welcome to Vantage This Week, a show where we recap the highlights of the week gone by. This week, India made a lot of headlines. The biggest one was for its economy. It has surpassed all expectations, growing at 8.4% 8 in the last quarter. But not everyone is happy about this. We'll tell you why some people are questioning this rapid growth. In Ukraine, Europe is facing a difficult question. Should it use frozen Russian assets to arm Ukraine? India faces charges of water terrorism after building a dam over the Ravi River. In the U.S. election, Democrats have a new favorite, and it's not Joe Biden, it's Michelle Obama. And does the month of February need an extra day every four years? What's the big deal about the leap day? All this and more coming up on the show. Let's get started. There are two kinds of football fans. One applauds every goal because they know how tough it is to score one. The other shifts the goalpost. They find reasons to criticize. Maybe the opponents were not tough enough, maybe the defense was poor, or maybe the player just got lucky. In this case, India has just scored a wonderful goal. I'm talking about the GDP numbers. Experts said India would grow by 6.6% in the last quarter. That's October, November and December. 6.6% was a projection, but the actual growth was 8.4%. It's a ridiculously high number. In footballing terms, like a bicycle kick from the penalty box, that good. And most fans are applauding it. Like the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, they say India is easily the fastest growing economy. Yet, doubters remain. Look at this Bloomberg report. It says India's blowout GDP figure masks signs of slower growth. So what are they playing at? A different indicator called GVA. That's gross value added, GVA. Now, some experts are saying that GDP is great, but what about GVA? So tonight, let's answer that question. What is GVA? Why is it relevant? And why has it suddenly popped up? Is this a case of shifting the goalpost? Some technicalities first. Both GVA and GDP are measures of economic output. You can calculate GVA from the GDP. Just add all the subsidy payments by the government, subtract the tax revenue, and what you're left with is gross value added, GVA. India's GVA rose 6.5% in the last quarter. Before that, it grew by 7.7%. So India's GVA growth has slowed down. And the naysayers have latched onto this. Suddenly, GDP does not matter. Everyone's talking about the GVA. Convenient, isn't it? But let's indulge them for a moment. Why has the GVA pace reduced? It could be because of two major reasons. Either India's tax collection has increased a lot, or maybe the subsidy payments have fallen. Now, we don't know which one is true. But forget the technicalities for the moment. Focus on how important these numbers are. 8.4% GDP growth does not happen randomly. It shows that the economy is resilient. It shows confidence and trust in India's trajectory. And do not forget the context. When you read India's GDP numbers, you must factor two things. Number one, the global slowdown. Most major economies are struggling. The likes of Germany and Japan are in a technical recession. China's growth is just 5.2%. Imagine logging 8.4% in that context. It shows that India is a bright spot, like a winch pulling the global economy up. Factor number two, inflationary pressures. In 2022 and 2023, the Reserve Bank of India increased lending rates almost six times back to back. The idea was to curb the rising inflation, but in April last year, the RBI hit pause. It decided to hold the rate steady. It was a brave move at that juncture. Because even halfway into 2023, India's inflation was more than 7%, but the gamble paid off. The latest inflation number is 5.1%. If you exclude food and fuel, it's just 3.6%. Not perfect, but getting there. So India deserves a lot of credit for this GDP growth. It's not easy in these circumstances. I guess the question is, what next? We are into the last month of this financial year. The earlier projection for annual growth was 7.3%. It has now been increased to 7.6%. That should make India the fastest growing major economy in this financial year. Some, some tweaks are necessary, though. Manufacturing, for example, needs more attention. It grew by 11% compared to 14% in the quarter before. 
Private consumption is also a problem. It's very sluggish at 3.5%. Investment, though, is the driver. Investment increased more than 10% compared to last year. A lot of that is coming from the government. In fact, public capital expenditure remains the driver of India's growth and it's paying off. We're talking about things like roads and bridges, schools and hospitals, things that can multiply your growth. It's a question of when these dividends will kick in. Until then, let's applaud this miracle goal in a season where even penalties are scarce. This one is a stunner. What's the best way to know more about someone? Just look through their bills. Spending patterns tell us a lot about people, what they prioritize, what they ignore, and what they value. So tonight we're looking at India's bills. Where did Indian households spend their money? The answer lies in the Household Consumption Expenditure Survey. It is prepared by the Ministry of Statistics. The latest one covers 2022 and 2023, and it has five major takeaways. Number one, rural India is now consuming a lot more. In 2011, the average monthly rural consumption was around 1,400 rupees. Now it is more than 3,700 rupees, from 1,400 to 3,700. That's a 164% rise. In fact, rural India outperformed urban India. Here in cities, consumption increased by 146%. So that, that's good news overall. Takeaway number two, Indians are spending less on food. Again, let's look at the numbers. In 2011, food made up almost 53% of rural spending. If you go back to 1999, it was almost 60% of the spending. But the latest figure is 46%. So less than half of rural spending is on food. Same in urban India. Cities used to spend 48% of their income on food. Now they spend just 39% on it. I guess the question is why? Because that's how the human mind and economics work. Indians now earn more than before. And when income rises, you spend a lesser share of it on food. You diversify your purchases. You start buying other things, maybe a bit of luxury, maybe some gadgets, maybe some experiences like travel. Now, this trend was deduced back in the 19th century. But as data shows, it is still relevant. And just to be clear, this does not mean that Indians are eating less. It means they're earning more. And from their overall income, a smaller share is being spent on food. Which brings us to takeaway number three. What is India eating? Again, we see a major shift. For a long time, the Indian diet was based on cereals and pulses, basically food grains. Just look at the data from 2011. Almost 26% of rural food spending was on food grains. What does that mean? Assume that your food expenditure per month is 100 rupees. You spend 100 rupees every month on food. Then out of this, 26 rupees was used to buy food grains, cereals and pulses, more than a quarter. But now that share is down to 15%. Again, the question is why? Because rural Indians are now buying other things. The share of milk is 18%, fruits is 8%, animal protein is 11%, and processed food is 20%. Same in urban India. Four categories make up 65% of food spending in Indian cities. Milk, animal protein, fruits, and processed food. Now, this shows a clear change in consumer behavior. The average Indian is buying new things. They're buying more fruit, more animal protein, and a lot of processed items. It's a sign of increasing income. It's also a good sign for nutritional standards because fruits and vegetables have important nutrients. Meat and eggs have protein. So the end result is a balanced diet, but I must say here, the processed food bit is slightly worrying. You do not want to be spending too much on sugary drinks and colas. Now, takeaway number four, more discretionary spending. We briefly touched upon this. Indians are spending more on durable goods, things like televisions and refrigerators. This is true in rural and urban India. Rural India spending on durables was just 2.6% in 1999. It has now risen to 6.9%. In urban India, it has risen from 3.6% to 7%. Again, this has knock-on effects, this kind of change in spending patterns. A fridge preserves your food for longer periods. A washing machine cuts down your chores. A computer speeds up your work. So these durables are making our lives easier. They're making us more productive. I know all of this sounds great, but takeaway number five is a downer. Yes, things are improving. 
but inequality persists. The poorest 5% in rural India spend just 46 rupees per day, the bottom 5%. In urban India, the poorest 5% are spending 67 rupees per day. Compare this to the top 5%. They spend 350 rupees per day in rural areas and 700 rupees per day in urban areas. Now look at this gap. Bridging this gap will be a big challenge, which is why this survey is so important, because any economic policy needs data. Data gives you direction. Data gives you ideas. And data eventually also delivers results if used properly. That's where such surveys come in. This one is released every five years. But the one in 2017-18 was not released. It followed the introduction of GST and demonetization. So the government said the data quality was an issue. So the last survey we have on this is from 2011-12, more than a decade ago. Safe to say India has changed a lot since then. The next government will have to formulate policies based on this data. It shows that the Indian consumer is eager. Her spending patterns have changed. The key is to build on that and more importantly, to reduce the inequalities. Let's turn to Ukraine now. Their military campaign has largely stalled. They're losing cities, losing soldiers, and losing morale. One reason for that is money. The US was supposed to give $60 billion to Ukraine, but that aid is pending. It hasn't been approved by the US Congress. So the European Union is debating a new idea and a rather controversial one. Listen to the EU chief. It is time to start a conversation about using the windfall profits of frozen Russian assets to jointly purchase military equipment for Ukraine. There could be no stronger symbol and no greater use for that money than to make Ukraine and all of Europe a safer place to live. Here's what that means. Most central banks and sovereign funds have assets abroad. They invest in foreign currencies or government bonds or simply bank deposits. And Russia was no different. Their central bank, the Russian central bank, had assets across the world, in the US, in Europe, in Canada, in Japan, even in Australia and Singapore. The biggest chunk was parked in Western nations. And how much money are we talking about? Around $324 billion, which is 16% of their GDP, $324 billion. When the war broke out, the West decided to freeze this Russian money. So Moscow could not access it anymore, $324 billion. And the message was quite simple. Stop the war and you will get your money back. It hasn't worked though. Even without this frozen money, Russia has the upper hand. So the new proposal is this. Take the profits from the frozen Russian assets and give them to Ukraine. It can be used to buy weapons and later in reconstruction. I know it sounds like an easy solution. Ukraine needs money. The West has frozen money. So why not give it to Kiev? The chorus is growing for such a move. You heard the EU president talk about it. And the US Treasury chief fully agrees with her. In fact, she says it's urgent. I also believe it's necessary and urgent for our coalition to find a way to unlock the value of these immobilized assets to support Ukraine's continued resistance and long-term reconstruction. Where well, we should act together and in a considered way, I believe there is a strong international law, economic and moral case for moving forward. Let me repeat that last part. The U.S. says there is a legal and moral case to use the frozen Russian money. But is that true? Well, there is precedent. Let me take you back to 1992. Saddam Hussein's Iraq had invaded Kuwait. In response, the United Nations Security Council took a drastic step. It asked all U.N. members to freeze Iraqi assets. And this money was then used to compensate victims of the Iraqi invasion. In 2003, it happened again. The US froze all Iraqi assets in their country. That was some $1.7 billion. Iraqi money in America, it was frozen. So countries have done it before. But the circumstances were different. In 1992, it wasn't a unilateral decision. It was agreed by the United Nations Security Council. So the decision had legitimacy. 
In 2003, the U.S. was at war with Iraq, so the assets belong to an enemy country. But Russia's case is very different. A, the UNSC has not frozen Russian assets, and B, only Ukraine is at war with Russia. The U.S. and Europe are not, which is why Brussels is delaying the, the decision. It's a complete grey area, legally, politically, and morally. Let's look at all these three aspects, in fact. If the West uses the frozen Russian money, Russia will challenge it legally. It could take years to settle those cases, not to mention it will spook investors. Imagine you're running a central bank or sovereign fund, maybe in West Asia or Africa. You see Brussels freeze and take away Russian assets. What's your reaction? Mostly fear. If it's Russia today, it could be you tomorrow. And that fear could keep investors away. It will shake confidence in Europe. The second problem is the politics. Not every European country wants to use Russian money. France, for example, they say that there is no legal basis for this. We don't have a legal basis to seize the Russian assets. And we should never act if we don't obey by the international law and by the rule of law. Because what is at the core of the European countries, at the core of the European construction... Plus, there could be blowback. If the West seizes Russian assets, Russia will respond in kind. It can seize the Russian businesses of Western firms. A tit-for-tat move. And finally, there is the moral question. This frozen money does not belong to Vladimir Putin. It's not his personal wealth. It belongs to the people of Russia. People who may or may not agree with Russia's war. Why are they being punished by the West? Why is their money being taken away? No answers. The West keeps talking about the rule of law, about a rules-based order, but the same West is eager to walk on this legal grey area. It's hypocrisy of the highest order. Just think about all the countries invaded and ravaged by the West. How much have they paid them? Absolutely nothing. So it's not about principles or justice. It's about vindictive and selective politics. Let's see if Europe goes ahead with it. The Russia-Ukraine war has entered its third year. What has been India's role in this war? Supplying humanitarian aid to Ukraine, refusing to join Western sanctions against Russia, and impressing upon all sides that this is not an era of war. This largely sums up India's role and position. But this may change if Germany has its way. They're hoping to buy Indian ammunition to arm Ukraine. It's a stunning claim made by a German newspaper. It says Berlin and New Delhi have started secret talks and that Germany wants to buy Indian ammo. Both sides are being discreet about this. We don't know how serious these conversations are and if they'll lead to a deal. But we do know that Europe is desperate. Ukraine is running out of firepower. America's military aid package is stuck and Europe is struggling to fill the gaps. We have to commit ourselves to do and provide whatever, you, whatever it takes. We should not say for how long as it takes, but whatever it takes. That was Europe's top diplomat. He traveled to Kiev this month and promised to do, quote unquote, whatever it takes. Even if it means tapping India for supplies. It sounds like a far-fetched idea. India hasn't picked any side in this, in this war in Ukraine. It has close ties with Russia, military and strategic ties, historical ties, and India is keen to protect this relationship. But Germany needs the ammo, and it's apparently willing to go the extra mile to explore every possible avenue. Reports say every two weeks, Germany's top officials meet in Berlin. They gather to discuss just one thing, Ukraine's military supplies and which countries can be approached to buy ammunition stocks. This meeting is attended by key decision makers, military officers and diplomats and civil servants. They go through their options and explore the possibilities. So what is their plan for India? Reports say Berlin is willing to use intermediaries to buy the ammo through a middleman so that the Indian government won't have any exposure. At this point, it's mostly speculation. But Russia will be watching all of this carefully because last month, Moscow had raised a concern with New Delhi. It had found Indian shells in Ukraine. That's right. And what kind of shells were these? 155 millimeter artillery shells commonly used in howitzers. How did these shells end up in Ukraine? 
One report said they were originally bought by Slovenia. They did not share who the shells were for, but once they were delivered, Slovenia just shipped them to Ukraine, apparently without keeping New Delhi in the loop. And this could happen again. So India will weigh its options carefully. Of course, Europe is not the only party scavenging for ammo. Russia too is on the lookout and it's said to be tapping North Korea. Last year, there was an exchange. North Korea made a special delivery to Russia. It sent 6,700 containers. It's hard to say what was inside them, but South Korea was watching these consignments and they've gathered some intelligence and tried to make an educated guess. They say the containers could have had 3 million artillery shells, 5,000 rounds of ammo, or a mix of both. And South Korea says this was a barter deal. So what did Pyongyang get in, uh, get in return? They got essential supplies, things like food, raw materials, and manufacturing parts. Since the beginning of this war, Pyongyang has been a reliable supplier for Moscow. Since September last year, North Korea has dispatched more than 10,000 containers to Russia. These containers had just two things, munitions or munitions-related supplies. So both Ukraine and Russia seem to be chasing the same goals. They want more firepower to keep the fight on, even though this could be the best time to discuss a ceasefire. Now let's talk about water, an essential resource that no one can live without. Water scarcity is the next big challenge. Many experts have predicted that future wars will be fought over water. India will have to guard against being drawn into such a conflict because it has an ongoing dispute with Pakistan. The dispute about dams and how they can influence water sharing between the two countries. Now recently, India built another dam. It is designed to divert the flow of the Ravi River away from Pakistan and towards the farmers of India. Critics in Pakistan are calling this, quote-unquote, water terrorism. But is that really the case? Our next report gets you the answers. Pakistan's popular newspaper, Dawn, published this story yesterday. It's about a protest rally organized by civil society groups. Then there was this piece with a headline that screams water terrorism. What's the trigger for the outrage? It's an Indian dam. It's called Shapur Kandi. Indian authorities recently finished building it. The dam is part of a multi-purpose project. It includes two hydropower plants. But the project is making headlines for one thing. The diversion of the river Ravi's waters. Earlier, some of these waters fell into Pakistan and turned into waste. India's new dam will minimize this wastage. It will streamline the flow of the river's waters, make it available to farmers from Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab. They'll be able to harness the supply for irrigation. The project has been stalled for decades. It was first cleared way back in the 1990s. P. V. Narasimha Rao, the then Prime Minister, had laid its foundation. But disputes between local governments and the lack of funding slowed down its progress. In 2018, New Delhi made an intervention and the project was finally revived. Now, when it's finally complete, it's causing headaches in Pakistan. Pakistani groups are making demands. They want the natural flow of the Ravi revived. On top of that, they want Pakistan and India to review the Indus Water Treaty. This consequential pact was signed in 1960. It set the rules for water sharing between the neighbours. Are these demands justified? As far as India is concerned, New Delhi is unlikely to pay any attention. For starters, waters from the Ravi never belonged to Pakistan. The Indus Treaty gives India full rights to these waters. But that hasn't stopped Pakistan from raising objections. On several occasions, Islamabad has moved to the World Bank, complaining about the construction of dams by India. Back in the 1960s, the World Bank had helped both sides and put together the Indus Treaty. But that doesn't give mediation rights to the World Bank. This is India's counter-argument as well. New Delhi argues that its dams are compliant with the Indus Treaty. But the challenges from Islamabad will keep coming. Water is quickly becoming more scarce. Groundwater supplies are drying up and the demand for fresh water and hydroelectricity are rising on both sides of the border. India and Pakistan have never fought a war over water. 
but if this dispute continues, it could easily turn into another conflict. To Pakistan now, where a woman was mobbed on the streets of Lahore. Why? Because she was wearing a kurta, a shirt, with an Arabic print on it. Her clothes had random words in Arabic. The crowd mistook it for verses of the Quran. So they surrounded her, raised slogans and asked her to remove the dress. At the end, she had to be rescued by the police. The woman is safe now. She has apologized for no fault of hers. But imagine what would have happened had the police not arrived on time. Our next report tells you about Pakistan's mob fury. It was a normal day in Lahore. This woman had stepped out to shop with her husband. She was in a restaurant when suddenly a crowd surrounded her. Why? Because of her clothes. The woman was wearing a normal kurta, but it had Arabic words on it. Nothing special. The dress had the Arabic word for beautiful. But the crowd didn't understand that. They thought it was verses of the Quran. They thought she was disrespecting the Quran. For them, it was blasphemy. Around 300 people gathered. The mob surrounded her. They raised slogans. They wanted her to take her dress off. Some even threatened to behead her. Amid all this, the woman stood alone. She was covering her face. She was scared. She didn't know what the mob could do next. That's when the police came in. They were called to the restaurant. They tried to pacify the crowd. But it was all in vain. That's when a female police officer jumped into action. Officer Nakvi tried to negotiate with the crowd. She had some success there. She went inside the restaurant and started helping the scared woman. The woman then changed into a burqa. She covered her face and finally got out of the restaurant. The police formed a chain around her she was then escorted to the police station. Muslim scholars were called to the station. They confirmed that it was just Arabic calligraphy, not the verses of the Quran. But still, the woman apologized. She was not at fault, yet she still said she didn't want to hurt anyone. She was in Lahore to do some shopping and has since left the city. The chief of Punjab police is now calling for Nakvi to receive an award for her bravery. Blasphemy is punishable by death in Pakistan. Blasphemy convictions are common in the country. At least 50 people are in custody over blasphemy charges. But many are lynched to death, even before any judicial trial. They are usually killed by mobs, even if the allegations aren't proven. Since 1990, at least 85 people have been killed just over blasphemy allegations. Some parties have even called for blasphemers to be beheaded. In August 2023, a mob burnt Christian churches and houses in Faisalabad. They accused the community of desecrating the Quran. The blasphemy law is often used against Pakistan's minorities. This incident could have escalated if the police did not reach on time. And all of this happened just a day before Punjab got its first female chief minister. Mariam Nayaz will now rule the state. But can she keep the mob under control? Now to the US presidential election. We know who the Republicans want, Donald Trump. But on the Democratic side, the choice is even simpler. You have a sitting U.S. president. Joe Biden is the incumbent. He has virtually no challengers. He's breezing through the primaries. In fact, he's just won the Michigan primary. But there is one problem. Joe Biden is 81 years old. He's overseen two wars. His approval ratings are at an all-time low. And even though he may not have any competition, it's not like he's popular. Take Michigan, for example. Biden won there. But it wasn't a clean sweep. More than 100,000 people voted uncommitted. One lakh people said they were uncommitted, meaning they're not too sure about Biden. But do you know who they're sure about? Michelle Obama. The former first lady of the United States. The Democrats apparently love her. And a latest poll proved just that. Democrats were asked about who could replace Biden. 20% chose Michelle Obama. 15% chose Kamala Harris. And 12% believe it should be Hillary Clinton. 
So the Democrats want a shake-up. But their popular choice is not someone in the system. It's an outsider, in this case, Michelle Obama. The question then is, why does America love her? And can she shake up the Democratic ballot? Michelle Obama has always been popular. She came into the limelight in 2008. That's when her husband, Barack Obama, started campaigning. The couple was loved on the campaign trail. Once Obama became president, the appeal only grew. Their stint in the White House was quite popular. And Michelle wasn't just any other first lady. She did not live in the shadows of her husband. She held her own. Perhaps that appealed to a lot of people. She spearheaded campaigns, advocated for military families, and encouraged healthy eating. People saw her as authentic, and it added to her appeal. Michelle Obama had one of the highest acceptance rates among all U.S. First Ladies. In 2017, the Obamas left the White House, and since then, Michelle has come into her own. She wrote a book. She signed a Netflix deal. She hosted a popular podcast. She graced magazine covers, and she spoke at Democratic conventions. In 2020, Gallup named her as the most admired woman. She made it to a list of 100 most influential people. She enjoys a 60% favorability rating. So she ticks all the right boxes. Plus, she's young, at least younger than Trump and Biden. And she's impactful enough to rally the voters. Basically, Americans seem to love Michelle Obama. But do they love her enough to make her president? The answer depends on who you ask. 41% voters want Biden to step down. 20% of them say Michelle should replace him. The Republicans, meanwhile, call this, quote-unquote, pure lunacy. And what about Michelle Obama herself? Is she looking at another four years in the White House? It's a question she's been asked many times, and she's had only one answer. She won't do it. In 2023, she told Oprah Winfrey that she would never run for president. But in 2024, she's changed her tune, it seems. On a recent podcast, Michelle Obama said she is worried about the election outcome. Let me quote from what she said. What's going to happen in this next election? I'm terrified about what could possibly happen because our leaders matter. Who we select, who speaks for us, who holds that bully pulpit. It affects us in ways sometimes I think people take for granted. She says she's terrified. Is this a cue? Or is the world reading too much into it? I guess we'll find out soon enough. In 2023, India landed on the moon and aimed for the sun. This year, India is planning for another space milestone. Its first manned space mission, Gaganyaan. The launch will happen in 2025. The mission will carry three people to a low Earth orbit. They will stay there for three days. Today, the Prime Minister revealed the names of these astronauts, the ones who will be part of the mission. And if the mission succeeds, India will achieve new space glory. It will become only the fourth country in the world to send humans into space. Our next report tells you how India is pushing boundaries in space. The year was 1984. It was a freezing evening in Soviet Kazakhstan. But Rakesh Sharma was in a burly white spacesuit. He was inside the Soyuz T-11 spacecraft, gearing for takeoff at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Over 2,000 kilometers away, people in India were glued to their TV screens. After all, he was the first Indian heading to space. Rakesh Sharma's flight was historic. But it was on board a Russian spacecraft. Forty years later, India wants to send more Indians to space. This time on an Indian spacecraft. It's called the Gaganyaan mission. In Sanskrit, it means the celestial vehicle. The Gaganyaan is slated for launch in 2025. It will carry a three-member crew to a low Earth orbit, around the distance of 400 kilometers. They will be there for three days. They will then be brought back to Earth, landing in Indian seawaters. The total cost of the mission is 900 crore rupees. That's around $1 billion. Today, Prime Minister Modi was in the state of Kerala. He visited the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. There, he named the astronauts Prashant chosen for the mission. They are Group Captain Prashant Balakrishnan Nair, Group Captain Ajit Krishnan, Group Captain. 
Group Captain Angad Pratap and Wing Commander Subhanshu Shukla. ये सिर्फ चार नाम और चार इंसान नहीं है ये 140 करोड़ एस्पिरेशंस को स्पेस में ले जाने वाली चार शक्तियां हैं चालीस वर्ष के बाद कोई भारतीय अंतरिक्ष में जाने वाला है लेकिन इस बार टाइम भी हमारा है काउंट डाउन भी हमारा है और रॉकेट भी हमारा है दीज फोर मैन वे सिलेक्टेड फ्रॉम अ पूल ऑफ एयर फोर्स पायलट they have undergone extensive tests both physical and psychological they first received training in russia this was for a period of 13 months now they are being trained in bengaluru gaganyaan could be a game changer for india space sector if successful india could be the fourth country in the world to send humans to space after the us soviet union and china mujhe jaankar bahut acha laga कि गगनयान में यूज होने वाले ज्यादातर उपकरण मेड इन इंडिया है ये कितना बड़ा संयोग है कि जब भारत दुनिया की टॉप थ्री इकोनॉमी बनने के लिए उड़ान भर रहा है उसी समय भारत का गगन याद भी हमारे स्पेस सेक्टर को एक नई बुलंदी पर ले जाने वाला है लास्ट ईयर इंडिया मेड हिस्ट्री इट बिकेम द फर्स्ट कंट्री टू लैंड नियर द मून साउथ पोल जस्ट वीक्स लेटर इंडिया ऑल्सो लॉन्च आदित्य एल वन दिस वॉज इट्स फर्स्ट ऑब्जर्वेशन मिशन टू द सन इंडिया हैज मोर एम्बिशियस प्लान इन द विंग्स There's the Gaganyaan mission that's slated for 2025 but that's not all. India aims to set up its own space station by 2035. It also wants to send an astronaut to the moon by 2040. But the success of all of that hinges on the Gaganyaan mission. It's one take off that India will watch with bated breath. Our last story tonight is about well Today February 29th today is a leap day it is not a holiday and it goes unmentioned on many calendars the only way many remember it is through a google doodle perhaps but leap day is special in its own way in fact February 29th is actually the most important date on the calendar it is the one date that keeps all other dates in check to understand why let's go back to basics you know that the earth orbits the sun but it takes the earth a weird amount of time to do this not 365 days not 366 days but this number of days 365 days 6 hours and 9 minutes so the earth takes just over 365 days to take a trip around the sun and this is highly inconvenient If we were to follow this we would celebrate new year at midnight one year then 6 a.m. the next party planning would be a bigger hassle than it already is and everything would fall out of sync but what if we just stuck to 365 days it's not like the time police will hound anyone well, in that case the calendar would fall out of sync with seasons after 100 years the calendar would be off by 25 days after 750 years those living in the northern hemisphere would be celebrating christmas in summer and valentine's day in the autumn so love would be in the air and dead leaves would be on the ground that's hardly romantic so earthlings came up with a solution they decided to add an extra day every 4 years on february 29th which is today it's a mathematical marvel yet some people want to wipe it off the calendar like time measurement mavens the scientists who think leap days bogus they have proposed alternative calendars 
One of them eliminates leap day and adds a full week at the end of December every six years. According to that calendar, today is February 30th. 3-0. Sounds wrong just saying it. But there are some others who aren't fans of leap days, like those born on leap days. To all the leaplings watching Vantage, here's a fun fact for you. Your chances of being born on February 29th were slim, about 1 out of 1,461. But despite the tiny odds, here you are. We get that some leapers don't take pride in the special status. Maybe it's the absurd nicknames, like leaplings or leapers. That's my bad. Maybe it's the tired questions like, do you get presents once, presents once every four years? Or maybe it's the country leapers are born into. Scottish culture, for example, believes that leaplings are unlucky. So did the Soviet Union. After all, communist dictators aren't known to love individuality. The Greek and Germans think leap years are unlucky as well. But they aren't the only ones. Many parents still dodge leap days. There are reports of parents rescheduling C-sections and doctors willingly changing birth dates on certificates. But that rarely applies to Indians. In India, those born on February 29th are often considered special. They're believed to possess unique talents. But no one loves Leap Day like the Irish. According to legend, St. Patrick was once asked if women could propose to men. Now, St. Pat Patrick did not love the idea, but he agreed on one condition. Women could propose only on Leap Days. What can I say? People pleasers and their creative solutions. So even today, Irish women propose marriage to men on leap dates called the ladies' privilege. Whether it is a privilege is debatable, but the tradition is huge in Ireland. It was later adopted in Denmark and Finland as well. Meanwhile, America has its own leap day traditions. It is to party four times harder. In New Mexico, leaplings gather to celebrate birthdays together. In Texas, a four-day festival is held in honor of them. And across the world, leapers can take advantage of free food specials and the rest of us can enjoy leap day sales. But tradition or not, there are many reasons to love leap day. It brings the possibility of extra time, of trying something new. The chance to be an exciting person, even if it is once every four years. As for Leaplings, Leap Day gives you the opportunity to stay forever young because you could be 64 years old and still be celebrating your sweet 16. Now, who wouldn't want to leap for Leap Day?